Uh, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Vo Dr. Vody Bauckham. Vody comes uh, from a, uh, came from Houston, Texas today. Uh, that's where he and his family are located. Uh, Vody is a world-renowned speaker. Uh, he speaks at conferences. He's a pastor. He's a biblical teacher. Uh, he's, he's got some books out on a table. I, I'm, re I'm, I'm reading Family Driven Faith right now. It's outstanding. And uh, he's an amazing man of God. I've heard him speak at some different venues before, and I think you're going to be really blessed. He's going to be talking about biblical manhood and womanhood, and I think you're going to learn a lot. So let's woken up, Vody. Well, good evening. to teach you folks in western Kentucky a little something about Texas hospitality. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Oh, that was much better. It's good to be here um, tonight. I have, uh, have been excited about this for quite some time. I'm always excited to be in the presence of Paul Washer. Um, it's the man that I've always admired greatly and a man who is becoming a dear friend um, and in these days where the gospel is so polluted, um, it is refreshing and encouraging and challenging um, to hear a man uh, proclaim it uh, without apology and with incredible clarity and passion and boldness. Um, and it is what we desperately need in our day. It's interesting, you know, that Paul talked about the Puritans and the influence of the writing of the, the Puritans in his own life. Um, and one of the things that really has knit our hearts together is that same influence in my life of the writings of the Puritans in, in a number of areas, uh, but specifically in the areas of the applications of the gospel to everyday life uh, and the application of the gospel to the area of biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, uh, and the family. There are two sides of my life. Um, there is the one side, which is the professional side. You heard a little bit about this evening where um, I serve as a pastor and as a professor. And a, uh, my, my area of specialty is the area of cultural apologetics. Um, and apologetics is just a, a fancy word that means a defense of the faith. It comes from the Greek word apologia, which is used in First Peter chapter 3 when Peter says that we're to always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks us the reason for the hope that is within us. And that, that word for the reasoned response that we're to give is apologia. And from that word, we get our word apologetics. And so it's giving a reasoned response for why it is we believe what we believe. Cultural apologetics is a term really popularized by Francis Schaeffer. And it's the idea of applying that discipline to contemporary cultural issues. And so that's the one side of my life. The other side of my life is the place where I am Bridget's husband and Jasmine and Trey and Elijah and Asher's father and the father of all of the other arrows yet to come. And it is in the place where those two areas merge together where I've been spending a lot of my time lately, where cultural apologetics meets the biblical understanding of manhood and womanhood and, and the family from a biblical theological perspective because I believe the culture has sold us a bill of goods as it relates to what manhood is, as it relates to what womanhood is, and as it relates to what the family is. We've been lied to, hoodwinked, bamboozled. <laughs> okay? We've, we've been sold a bill of goods as it relates to the biblical family and what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman. We just don't get it. We don't know. Tonight we'll look at biblical manhood. Tomorrow we'll look at biblical womanhood. Um, but again, it's something that we have failed to understand in the biblical context. Just like these issues of the gospel, these things that are clear in the scriptures. But because we've heard the polluted versions so often and for so long, the truth is almost foreign to us. It is that way as well when it comes to these ideas of biblical manhood and womanhood. And we'll see that as we journey through uh, our time together over these next couple of days. In looking at biblical manhood, I want us to go back to the beginning. 
I want us to look in the book of Genesis. If you will, open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the creation overview. In Genesis chapter 2, things slow down a little bit. And rather than just a general synopsis, we get some more specifics about creation. And specifically about the creation of man and woman. And we see this here beginning at verse 15. I want us to see this here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. And remember, this is before the fall. This is before corruption has entered in. Not long before because it doesn't take long for corruption to enter in, for the fall to enter in. But this is what it looks like in perfection. This is not what it looks like when it's marred and it's being restored. It's interesting. We're now looking at the other side of the coin. We've looked at this picture of God bringing about restoration, of God recreating man, if you will, through this process of salvation, this process of regeneration. But now we're going to look at the other side of the coin. We're going to look at this picture of perfection. We're going to look at man in his pristine form. And what we see there just might surprise you because, again, we've been sold a bill of goods. Look with me, beginning at verse 15 of chapter 2 of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, Eat of it, you shall surely die. Verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I love that verse. I really do. Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I just have this picture in my mind of God creating man. And there's Adam. And God looks at Adam and says, That boy ain't going to make it by himself. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. We just pause here for a moment. Every type of animal that God had created, he brought before this man. And this man named them all. We don't have minds like that anymore. Can you imagine that? Naming all the animals. And 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 you you couldn't just go, that's four-legged, upright, crawling thing. Because there's a whole bunch of those, you know. (laughs) Each one of these he named. That's the kind of mind this man had. And even with a mind like that, God said, wasn't good for him to be alone. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. In the Hebrew, it's a beautiful picture that's painted there by the words that he uses. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. She should be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. That, that she's, she's mine. She's part of me. Next verse. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And here is this beautiful picture of man in pristine conditions. And there are some things that are present here that some may find surprising. And as it relates to biblical manhood, these things are absolutely essential. If a man wants to call himself a man from a biblical perspective, these things have to be in place. 
Now, unfortunately, I, at first we've got to do some deep programming here. I want you to understand what has happened to us. We, we define manhood. You know, it has been said by the three Bs, okay? We, we define manhood on the ball field, in the bedroom, and by the billfold. In our culture, that's how we've been taught to define manhood. On the ball field, in the bedroom, and by the billfold. That's it. How does he perform athletically? How does he perform sexually? How is he with the ladies? And how much money does he have? That's how we define manhood in our culture, whether we like it or not. And unfortunately, for those of us who claim to be followers of Christ, and in large part because of what we've just heard, our definitions are no different. We define manhood by the three B's. I am the homeschool father, father of four. My oldest son is not with me today. He travels with me. I travel about eight days a month. Um, any less and be hard for me to feed my family. Any more, it'd be hard for me to say with a straight face that they're the most important thing in my world. But I, I travel about eight days a month, and my oldest son travels with me. He does that full time. Uh, so from the time my oldest son became 13 years old, I became his teacher. When he was 13, he went through a manhood ceremony, and one of the parts of that entering into manhood was his mother turned over the books, and I became his teacher of all of his subjects, and more particularly, more specifically, his discipler. He is my disciple. There is no man in the world that it's more important for me to disciple than my son. And so as a result of that, he spends his time uh, traveling with me. And the interesting thing about that is I get a lot of questions, several questions I get, you know. People look at me and they go, you know, you're a pretty big guy. You look like you maybe, you're, you know, you're a ball player or something like that. So yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, been there, done that. Okay, it's great. And, you know, son, you know, he's 14. He's, you know, a pretty, pretty big kid. And I'm just wondering, you know, with you guys doing this, how's he going to play ball? When people say that to me, here's what I hear. I, I want to know how your son is going to be able to worship at the altar of the sport god. To which I respond, who cares? I don't. It's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. We don't need another ball player. We don't. We need men with trained minds. We need men with godly, biblical character. We need men with multi-generational vision. We need men who commit themselves and all their faculties to the glory of Almighty God. I am raising a warrior for Christ. That's what I'm raising. Not an entertainer. That's not what I'm raising. A warrior for Christ. Who cares? Well, you know, team sports, they build character. Really? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? Because if you believe that, let's test your premise. Team sports build character. That means guys who spend more time in team sports ought to have more character than guys who don't. So the guys in this culture with the greatest character ought to be in the NFL and the NBA. Is that your final answer? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Besides that, how, how, how did George Washington build character? He didn't play team sports. Adams, Jefferson. I'll give you one better. How did Jesus build character? Hmm? Was it Pop Warner? See, we think like that. Why? Because how do you measure manhood according to our culture? The ball field, the bedroom, and the billfold. That's how you measure manhood according to our culture. And that's how we've learned to measure manhood. Does that mean I, I think sports are evil or that? I didn't say that. It's not what I said. That's not what I said. But once we step back for a moment and ask ourselves some questions, we realize that not only is that a limited understanding of what a man is, but it also doesn't come close to approaching scriptural truth. What is a man? And here's what's even less fortunate. There are women walking around, some of you in this very room, 
And you'll be married in the not too distant future. And our culture has said to you, you measure manhood by what? The ball field, the bedroom, the billfold. And that's what you're looking for. Claiming that you're following Christ, but what you're looking for in a man is not a reflection of biblical manhood and biblical character, but a reflection of our carnal culture. What type of marriage do you think you're going to have? How long is the ball field going to satisfy you, ladies? We don't get to do that long. How long is the billfold going to satisfy you, ladies? Because certainly all women with rich husbands are constantly happy. You're right. How long is the bedroom going to satisfy you, ladies? Hmm? So if that's the measure that our culture has given us, no wonder... Those who look for that in a man end up with disillusionment quickly. But if it's not that, then what is it? Three things we see here, even before the fall. Three things that a man must be committed to if he's going to reflect biblical manhood. At least these three. And this is the minimalist version here, all right? We could, we could go into a lot more than this. But this will encompass all that we need to understand for here and for now. Three things. Number one, he must be committed to God-honoring labor. He must be committed to God-honoring labor. God does not abide lazy men and neither should we. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. He must be committed to God-honoring labor. Ladies... Tonight, what I'm going to do for you ladies is I'm going to speak to you as a father. Okay? I have a 17-year-old daughter. We talk about these things a lot. My primary goal in my 17-year-old daughter's life is preparing her and partnering with her to see to it that she has a biblically qualified, well-suited mate for marriage. It's my number one goal in my 17-year-old daughter's life. It's my job to protect her from unqualified, worthless men. It's my job as her father. And tonight, ladies, I'll do that for you, just for the time that we have together, all right? I will play that role for you tonight. I will treat you like I treat my own daughter. And I say to my own daughter, do not abide a lazy man. Don't look twice at a lazy man. If he is not committed to God-honoring labor, he is not worthy of your hand in marriage. I will not, I will not authorize that marriage. I'm not signing off on it. Matter of fact, I refuse to allow that kind of man to get close enough for my daughter to even become interested in him. Why are you going to do that? You know, when she goes out on these dates and she just, she goes out on what? Find that one in the text. Find it in the text. Find that concept. The modern American dating concept in the text. It's not there. You have betrothal. You have marriage. You have relationships between individuals who intend to marry you don't have this idea of people who just kick it because they like each other for right now. That's how you end up with the wrong one. You get involved before you evaluate. That's a problem. That's a problem. And, and, and again, as a father, you know, here's the picture that our culture paints. Our picture paints this culture. A father is doing his job if, you know, when a young man comes over, a suitor comes over for his teenage daughter, he sits down, you know, and he's, he's got this intimidating pose, and you stick your chest way out, and you bow all up, you know, and you, you take your rifle out, and you're cleaning your rifle, you know, and you've got a big old, you know, some snuff right there, and you, and you spin your stuff, and you clean your rifle and stuff, and what time are you supposed to have her home? You know, what time, you know, you scare him up real good. That's our culture's picture. And we think a man's doing a good job if that's what he does before his teenage daughter goes out with a young man. 
Let me just, let me just change the scenario just briefly. Just, just slightly change the scenario. Same picture. Except now I have a $200,000 Lamborghini Testarossa in front of my house. And a snot-nosed 17, 18-year-old boy who has not yet walked into manhood because our culture hasn't asked him to is going to come over my house to drive my $200,000 Lamborghini Testarossa. Am I going to be satisfied just cleaning my gun and scaring him real good and then giving him the keys? See, here's what bothers me. Our culture has taught you to value a $200,000 car more than a man's daughter. That's sick. You gave your $200,000 car to a 17-year-old boy? You're an idiot. But when I said that about my daughter, you thought I was crazy. Why? You've been lied to. That's why. I'd much sooner give up the keys to a $200,000 car than to take a chance on some young man manipulating and abusing the emotions of my daughter. And since you're playing that role tonight, that means you, ladies. The first thing we're looking for as we partner together as father and daughter, is a man who is committed, committed to God-honoring labor. Secondly, and we'll look at the, each of these in turn in the text. Secondly, a man who is committed to God's law. Committed to God's law. And I know what you say. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is before the fall. There is no law. <laughs> you hold on to that idea, all right? Thirdly, this man must be committed, committed to the priority of the family. To the priority of the family. Okay? Let's look at these three in turn. First of all, committed to God honoring labor. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Now this, the Garden of Eden is the perfect man is in the perfect environment. A lot of people think of work as something evil, as something bad, as something odious. It must be the result of the fall, right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that the case? No, no, no. He puts him in there to work it and keep it. There's work before the fall. It's not work that's a product of the fall. It's our attitude toward work that's a product of the fall. Look with me in chapter 3. In chapter 3, you see the fall. And after that, you see these three curses. And look at verse 17. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. By the way, stop there for a moment. Notice he didn't say, Adam... Because you ate from the fruit of the tree. Hey, I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. God said, because you listened to that woman. Take it for what it's worth. All right. Because you listened to the voice of your wife. By the way, I'll explain that later. Don't worry, ladies. And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. Out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. It's the toil and the labor and the hardship of work that is a result of the fall. Not work itself. Not work itself. You know, you hear about the Protestant work ethic. This idea of the Puritan work ethic. That in all labor, there is gain. That labor is a reward in itself. That's something that's foreign to us. But laziness, sloth, is sinful. It's godless. Turn with me, if you will. Look to the right with me. And look at Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. 
Proverbs chapter 6. In verse 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. So here's the ant. Nobody's saying, go do this, go do that. No chief, no nothing. The ant just does it. Consider the ant. Think about that. Verse 9. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Turn to the right. Look at chapter 26 in this same book. In verse 13. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. Laziness will make you a coward. Amen? Laziness will make you a coward. You'll always find an excuse not to work. Ladies, are you running up on men who find excuses not to work? Or men who always need somebody to tell them what to do and when to do it? Hmm? Or a man who's diligent. Which is it? Biblical manhood is characterized by a love for God-honoring labor. Look at the next part of this. As a door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. By the way, you notice something similar between chapter 6 and chapter 26. A little sleep. A little slumber, you see, in chapter 6. Here, you see like a door turning on his hinges. There's a sluggard in his bed. Ladies, you got a man who doesn't want to get up in the morning? Hmm? I don't write the mail. I just deliver it. That's laziness. It's ungodly. It's ungodly. Look at the next part of this. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. (laughs) That's just lazy. (laughs) I'm hungry. Well, eat. (laughs) What's wrong? I don't feel like bringing my hand back up to... That's lazy. Okay? That's the picture that's painted here. So lazy. That the effort to bring the food and nourishment that he needs back to his mouth is not even there. By the way, this is the epitome of all laziness. God says, if you want to be sustained, labor and toil. So if you are lazy, you are actually committed to your own destruction. And ladies, if you end up with a lazy man, you're committed to yours. Look at verse 16. The slugger, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. He's always got an excuse for his laziness. Always got an excuse for his laziness. He's wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Now, you line up seven men who can just, you ask them a question and they boom, 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 there's the answer. The lazy man, I, you, you, one thing he's not lazy about is making excuses. That's ungodly. That is not biblical manhood. A lazy man does not qualify when we're looking for biblical manhood. Turn with me to the right. I want you to see something else. Look in the New Testament. Look at 2 Thessalonians. I want you to see something here in 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Okay. 
doesn't look right because it's the wrong book. In verse 6. Now, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. So the apostles taught the churches about laziness. Okay? So this is not some, you know, way out there, unimportant issue here. The apostles themselves taught the churches about laziness. Verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So here's what the apostles are saying. We had every right as apostles to come to you and say, because we're teaching you the word and because you're apostles, the workman is worthy of his hire. You need to take care of us because we're taking care of you spiritually. But because laziness was so prevalent here in Thessalonica, they said in order to teach this church a lesson, we're not going to take anything from them. We're going to work in order to model for them what biblical manhood is. So the apostles didn't receive the support in Thessalonica that they could have asked for. And they did so in order to demonstrate to this church a biblical work ethic. Keep reading. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Man doesn't work. Don't let him eat. You know, there are some times when in church it is sinful to give benevolence to a man. If a man is lazy, God intends for him to be hungry. So if we're giving to a man who is lazy, we're actually working against God. And the Bible says here clearly in black and white, if a man doesn't work, don't let him eat. Don't feed a man who's not willing to work. Don't do it. Don't do it. You are encouraging his laziness. Don't do it. Hunger is an incredible motivator. Even Adam, before the fall, in perfect, pristine surroundings, worked the garden. He worked it. Turn with me to the right. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is a spiritual issue here. Verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A commitment to God-honoring labor is a mark of biblical manhood. It is an absolute necessity. And it's not just individuals who are not willing to work. Again, I'm, my point here is not that you have a man, you, you know, who just doesn't like work or is just unwilling to work. I, I mean, it's also if a man doesn't like to work, if he's not committed to doing all that his hands find to do and sees that as honoring God. Everything that my hands find to do. 
I do it to bring honor and to bring glory to God. And I see excellence in that. I seek excellence. I want excellence in everything my hands find to do. That's biblical manhood. Biblical manhood says, I may be a street sweeper. But I tell you what, at the cleanest streets in the whole city, because I clean streets to the glory and honor of God. You can go to work every day and still be lazy. Amen? You can go to school every day and still be lazy. You can go to school every day and make good grades and still be lazy. That was me. Find out that you can kind of make it. (laughs) Find out that you can memorize things well. So what do you do? You wait until the last minute. That's a mark of laziness. When you go into a class... Are you interested in maximizing your mastery of the subject or doing as little as possible to gain the grade that you need? Which is it? Answer that question and you answer whether or not you're lazy. What are you studying? Whatever can get you out the quickest or whatever takes full advantage of the gifts, talents, abilities, and desires that God has given you. For his glory and for his honor. What is it? What is it? Ladies, these are the kind of questions we we have to ask. You see, when you and I sit down together and we're talking about your future mate, this is the stuff that we have to discuss. No lazy men. That's not biblical manhood. Secondly, not only a commitment to God-honoring labor, but also a commitment to the law of God. Back in Genesis 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That's the law of God. We don't even have the Ten Commandments, but we've already got a law of God. God lays down a law right here in the midst of perfection. So we don't have the law of God because of imperfection. No. Before the fall, we had the law of God. Before the fall. He must be committed to the law of God. Most men don't know the law of God. Let alone are committed to it. They don't know it. One of the little tests. Here's an interesting little test. I want you to think right now in your mind of the Ten Commandments. You know them? 95% of Americans do not. And that's as true of church goers as it is of those who don't go to church. Do you know the law of God? And again, I'm not saying everything. Do you just know the most basic the ten, you don't get more basic than the Decalogue. You don't get more basic than the Ten Commandments. Do you know the Ten Commandments? And men, if your answer to that is no, here's what I want to ask you. How are you going to sit up here in my face asking me for my daughter and you don't even know the Ten Commandments? You're supposed to be a godly man into whose hands I entrust one of the greatest resources that God has given to me, and you don't know the basics of his law? Get out of my house. It's exactly what I'd say to you. And don't come back again unless you at least know that much of the law of God. Why? Because you are asking to be the father of my future generations. And they will not be lawless. Committed to the law of God. Committed to the law of God. And again, for most of us, I mean, that's just something that's just foreign. We just don't know. 
Give me half. Give me five. (laughs) You see? But again, don't feel bad. (laughs) This is the culture that we live in. Remember what I told you? We've been lied to. This is the culture that we live in. We sit here going, ball field, billfold, bedroom. Is he committed to God honoring labor? He's a great ball player. Is he committed to the law of God? Is he? He's got a lot of money. If we're interested in biblical manhood, we have to be interested in the law of God. By the way, part of his responsibility is to communicate to you, ladies, the law of God. God gives this law to Adam. Adam turns around and gives this law to Eve. And one of the problems, don't know for certain, because the text doesn't necessarily say for certain, but when Eve communicates the law, when she's talking to the serpent, to the serpent, and by the way, her husband is there, so he's not protecting his wife. Huge problem. Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman... Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Wow. That's not what God said, is it? She hasn't been properly discipled. That's why in Romans 5, it says, through the sin of one man, Adam. Fall didn't come through the sin of Eve. Fall comes through the sin of Adam. Who's responsible? There's headship here. Even here. But wait a minute. I thought that headship was because of the fall and when there was the curse and God curses Eve and it says that he shall rule over you. And that's where we got this whole idea of headship. Which again is why some egalitarians argue that when we become Christians, that that whole idea of headship is no longer relevant because now we've sort of reversed that idea of the fall and because of that we have this egalitarian idea. No longer this idea of headship. Newsflash. We see headship way before the fall. Well, how do we see headship before the fall? Who was made first? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says Adam has headship because he was made first. By the way, Adam is exercising dominion over all of these other creatures by what? Naming them. Eve shows up on the scene. What does he do? Names her. Headship. Before the fall. So what does headship mean? Me mind you woman, me say you do. No, that's not headship. Headship means you don't get to say, God, it was that woman that you gave me. That's what Adam did. He threw his wife under the bus, then he tried to throw God under the bus. What happened? That woman that that you gave me. You also see headship because when Adam is cursed, what does God say? Because you listened to your wife. You did not exercise the headship that you were given. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see this picture of the husband washing his wife with the water of the word. In Ephesians chapter 6, we see this picture of the husband. In Ephesians chapter 6, and by the way, we get a repeat of part of the law. We get a repeat of the fifth commandment. In Ephesians chapter 6, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land. And fathers, 
Do not provoke your children to anger, but you bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Can I ask you a question, ladies? If it's a man's responsibility to disciple his wife and his children, why on earth would you go get a man who doesn't know the law of God? Hmm? Why? It happens all the time. That's not a man. That's a fractured vessel. That's not a man. And so here you are saying, I'm going to be the mother of thousands in generations to come. And because I think more about the ball field and billfolds and the bedroom, I will sacrifice the spiritual future of generations to come so that I can be satisfied with what the world says is most valuable. God help us. God help us. Because that's exactly what women are saying all over the place and claiming to be followers of Christ. It, it, Coming up talking about the possibility of marrying non-believers in, in relationships with men who are non-believers. First of all, that's black and white. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, that's black and white. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Do not. That's a clear-cut command. It's not even an option. I'm not even talking about that. That's not even worthy of discussion. If you're thinking about that, I'm going back to message number one, and I'm questioning whether or not you're even converted. I'm talking here... Not just about whether or not a person is coming into the kingdom by the skin of their teeth. I'm talking about whether or not somebody knows the law well enough to teach it to you. And to your children. Until you meet a man that's qualified to disciple you and your children, you have not met a man who's qualified to be your husband. Did I make that clear enough? Do all of my daughters hear that? He must be committed to the law of God. He has to be. He has to be. Finally, this man must be committed to the primacy of the family. Back in Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see this. There in verse 18, we see that statement. It is not good that man should be alone. I want you to grasp. I, I just, I just, I want you to grasp the magnitude of that statement. Six days in creation, there is the same pattern over and over again. Day one, let there be, then there was, it was good. Day two, let there be, then there was, it was good. Day three, let there be, then there was, it was good. Day four. All together, let there be, then there was, it was good. Day five, let there be, then there was, it was good. Day six, let there be, then there was, it was good. Every day, same pattern. First time in the creation process, God says something is not good, it's when a man doesn't have a woman. It's the first time in creation God says something is not good. That deep. Does this mean that every man has to be married in order to be complete? No. Because we know, for example, in Matthew 19, Jesus refers to some as being eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul refers to those in those circumstances in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because he says, I believe it's in verse 26, because of the present distress it is good for you to remain as you are. So we know that there are circumstances under which there are times when it may be better off for a man not to take a wife. And we know that there are individuals who have a special calling and gifting from God not to take a wife. So, so we know that when we look at the totality of Scripture. We know that. However, let me say this. Marriage is the preferred position. I argue from this text, every man ought to be prepared to be a husband and every woman 
ought to be prepared to be a wife. I'm raising every one of my sons and preparing my sons to be a husband. I'm raising my daughters and preparing my daughters to be wives. Well, 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 what if God has called them to be single? Here's the thing. Is there one standard for godly married people and another standard for godly single people? No. No, there's not. So I can't go wrong by preparing them to be the kind of person who's qualified to be a husband and a wife. I can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Well, 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 I don't agree with that. Because Jesus was single. Yeah, that's true. But he's engaged. The Bible says the church is his bride. And there's going to be a wedding. Jesus, our model of ultimate manhood, is engaged. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so if we want men to be Christ-like, they need to be men who are committed to the family. That's not what our culture says. Our culture says men are to treat marriage like a plague to be avoided as long as possible. That's what our culture said, even in the church. I know this. I got married the summer between my sophomore and junior year in college. I had just turned 20 years old. I didn't even have, I didn't have a driver's license. I got a driver's license so I could get my marriage license. I did. I went into the place and I had my student ID and they said they wouldn't give me a marriage license. I was like, well, what you need? Well, you can get a passport and it'll take you this long. Or you can get a license and it'll take you this long. (laughs) Go get me a license. (laughs) And I heard, I mean, oh man, Christian people, church folks, they were just, uh, it, it was like I was getting, it, it was like it was sin. You're what? We get married, dog. <laughs> we get married. You get, you get, but you're, you're so young. Like, yeah, good. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we get longer to be married to each other. But, what? But you have your whole life ahead of you. Yes. Yes. I do. And I'm looking at her. Oh, but see, uh uh-uh. That's not the way the church teaches young men to think about marriage. Marriage is something to be put off as long as possible. Even in the church, you need to go and be and do. Here's what we're communicating to young men. And we don't even realize this is what we're saying. You need to suck all of the joy out of life. And then when you've done that, Come to some woman and give her the leftovers. That's what we're teaching young men. Not you need to have as a priority in your mind that you are preparing to be a husband and a father with a multi-generational vision of raising up arrows to launch for the sake of the kingdom of God. In your youth, protect your purity. And when you become a man, guard yourself And pray that God would perchance grant unto you in your youth a woman with whom you can start a dynasty. That's how I want my sons to think. But people treated us like there was some, there was a book in the Bible that we hadn't read yet that said it was wrong, you know, second hesitations or something, you know. (laughs) Says thou shalt not marry until after graduation, you know. My Bible says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Amen? I'm like, wait a minute, man. I found my good thing. You want me to wait? She might get away. Well, you guys just need to, you just need to hold off. You just need to wait. Why? Better to marry than to burn with passion. I want her. But I will not defile her. Therefore, I'm going to marry her. Well, you just need to wait. Uh, Two reasons. I can't do that. Well, what two reasons you can't do that? Number one, if I ask my wife or my fiance 
to wait for me to graduate before we get married, I am saying to her that my education is more important to me than my marriage. And that's wrong. No way in the world my education is more important than my marriage. And I won't communicate that to her. I won't start my marriage off by putting things before my wife. Problem number two. The wisest man in the Bible, the strongest man in the Bible, and the most godly man in the Bible all fell into sexual sin. I am not wiser than Solomon. I am not more godly than David. And I am not stronger than Samson. I need to get married. Some of you out there know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you're one of these people who come up to me sometime and say things like, Yes, we're going to get married in the spring of 2011. <laughs> Help you. <laughs> See, we've been taught to put everything else before marriage and family. Everything else. First time we see God saying that it's not good. Here's the other thing that you see. You see God saying, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and be united with his wife. Cleave unto his wife. Be joined unto his wife. For this cause a man will leave his mother and father. Now in order to understand that, you've got to understand something that happens later on in the law. We already quoted from Ephesians chapter 6 what Paul says there to the church at F, to, uh, there to, to in, the, in his Ephesian letter about the first commandment with a promise. That's the fifth commandment, all right? So some of y'all, I just helped you out, you okay? You're just a little bit closer now to one of my daughters. That's the fifth commandment, okay? <laughs> now, sometimes the law is referred to as being written in two tables, the two tables of the law. The first four commandments are the vertical commandments about our duty to God. The last six about our duty to man. Now, here's what's interesting about that. You don't get a promise until commandment number five. Now, that's significant when you understand what one through four are that don't have promises. And I'll just paraphrase them for you. Commandment number one, I'm God, you don't get another one. Amen? That's the first commandment. God, can we get a promise with that? Nope, no promise. Commandment number two, don't even make nothing that look like me. Okay, we got to get a promise for that one. We can't even make little... Nope, no promise. Just do it. Commandment number three, don't mess with my name. Huh? That's right. Don't even misuse my name. You know you're going to give us a promise with that one. Stuff slips all the time. No. No. Commandment number four, work for six days, but not on the seventh. Don't even mess with my day. Can we get a promise with that? No. Commandment number five. Honor your father and your mother. With that one, I give you a promise. You think that's not significant? It's the first one in the second table. It's number one on the hit parade. Honor your father and your mother. It's commandment number five. You know what it comes before? Six, don't murder. Seven, don't commit adultery. Eight, don't steal. Nine, don't bear false witness. Ten, don't covet. And so we see there in the fifth commandment, this importance of honoring your mother and your father. There's a commandment. Honor your mother and your father. But what does God say about marriage both in Genesis 2 and then again in Ephesians chapter 5, for this cause, what cause? Marriage. Shall you leave your mother and father and be joined to your wife? For this cause. That ought to give you just a, just a little glimpse into the importance of marriage in the economy of God. Is every man called to be married? No, there are some, very few, who have a special gift or dispensation from God to not, and that's not part of the situation. 
But whether you're married or not, you still are committed to biblical family. Even in your own family. For example, back in Ephesians chapter 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So even in the context of your home, whether you ever get married or not, Because here's the question that my daughters want to ask me. And I know you want to ask me that because I'm your daddy. I know you, okay? And you're going, okay, daddy, how do we know if a man is committed to marriage and family? He's never had marriage. Yeah, but he's been part of a family. Is he obedient and respectful? And does he honor his mother and father? If he doesn't, he's not going to honor his marriage. So daughters, don't you bring me a disobedient, disrespectful son. Because if I wasn't willing to raise one, I'm not willing to let you marry one into my family. Okay? Does he understand the biblical concept of family? Does he have a multi-generational vision? Does he view himself as a father? Is he committed to children? Is he committed to that? Is he committed to providing for you in such a way that you can devote your life to those children? Is he committed to that? Or is he some pragmatic, utilitarian, materialistic American who sees you as another wage earner so he can live in ease? By the way, this was the minimalist version. There's a whole lot more to it than this. But if we're just stripping it down to the bare minimum, he must be committed first and foremost to God-honoring labor. Secondly, he must be committed to God's law. And thirdly, he must be committed to a biblical, multi-generational view of family. That is the very least that one would expect from anyone who claims to exemplify biblical manhood. And I know our time, we need to start our other...